Yes. All right, so thank you, storytellers, for standing up. I'm going to introduce first to my right, who's our uh, storyteller musician tonight. This is Marco Perella. And Marco Perella is an actor, writer, director, musician. And he's acted in over 75 film and TV shows like Miss Congeniality, JFK, and Walker, Texas, Ranger. And his book, Adventures of a No-Name Actor, won the award for the funniest book in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> he is also the permanent host for the Austin Symphony's Young People's, People's Concerts. And he's a founding what member? of the folk group, the Melancholy Ramblers. In a former life, he was building solar homes and he fought forest fires in the mountains of New Mexico. Marco Perello. told me I had to come stand up here and limp, so I will. Aww. Now, this is a story about my roadhouse days back in the 70s, 1972 precisely. I was 23 years old, and I was living in Taos, New Mexico at the time. I know you all think northern New Mexico is this wonderful spiritual paradise, but back then it was more of a war zone. You see, we had pretty much of a uh, medieval Catholic culture among the Hispanic people that lived in the northern New Mexico. And all these uh, hippies started arriving from everywhere to live on the land, man, you know. And of course, the Hispanics and Anglos steal our land. We weren't exactly stealing the land. Most of us were living in like teepees and steel stock tanks with a tarpaulin over it and things like that. You know, it wasn't really. But still, there was tension and there was a lot of trouble. 
Okay. Um, I was in a band, uh, two dulcimers and a guitar. We were far out, you know. <laughs> and uh, we had a little gig in a little town near Hot House on the way to the Ski Valley called Arroyo Seco, which is a wonderful gent gentrified little burg right now. But back then, it was a place you went to get dead. <laughs> you just didn't go there. The cops didn't even go there after dark. And there was a couple of bars, and you just kind of watched it. But there was a, one place there uh, that a guy hired us to play. It was called the Gay 90s. I don't know why he named it the Gay 90s, but he had this dream, you know. And it was a two-story thing with big, tall ceilings like this in the, uh, in the downstairs bar, and the bartender and his wife lived upstairs. The owner, the bartender. So we... Uh, we set up our little gig, and, you know, there was about 30 people there, which was the biggest crowd we'd ever played for. And about uh, 20 hippies came down from the hills. They, they, they were so desperate for entertainment that they would actually pay to come see a band with two dulcimers in it. <laughs> <laughs> so they were there, and we were playing. Uh, it was me playing my dulcimer, and uh, my friend Oren. Oren was a very strange dude. He used to play with Captain Beefheart. His eye teeth were exceptionally long, so when he'd smile, he looked just like a vampire. He was like a little vampire. And whenever he'd get into the songs, he'd go about, yeah, like that, and everybody would freak out, you know. Ah. <laughs> he was kind of spooky, you know. If we were playing it, we were using it, you know. And then we had Fred on guitar. Fred was a very serious person, very healthy. He had very orderly, grew his own sprouts and made his little sandwiches, and he had his Martin guitar, and he practiced all day, and he was very different in personality from me and Oren, but he was a really good guitar player, so he played along with us, you know. So we're playing, having a good time, and all the hippies are dancing, you know, doing the hippie stomp. Everybody having a good time. Now, also in the bar that night were a bunch of... Uh, uh, Hispanics, because we didn't call them Latinos, and they aren't Chicanos, because they come from the old Spanish culture, which is very old in northern New Mexico. And, you know, these guys all worked at the molybdenum mine, molybdenum, whatever it is. <laughs> they use it in spaceships, that's all I know, and they strip mine the mountains to get it. So we just call them the Molly Boys. Everybody call them the Molly Boys. You know, there's about 12 of the Molly Boys sitting at the bar, you know, looking on at all the little hippie girls doing their brawless dances of abandon, you know, and wondering why they were born into a medieval Catholic culture. <laughs> all they had to look forward to was being a penitente at Easter, you know, and maybe they get to be Jesus and get roped up to the cross. They still did that around all around Taos in those days. There's still, you can see the old maradas where they used to do that. Just to emphasize the... <laughs> The different, the cultural divide was pretty strong there. Okay, so everybody's dancing, having a good time. The, you know, but the Molly boys are drinking tequila and beer. The hippies are doing orange juice and LSD. <laughs> it's like, you know, a nuclear pile reaching critical <laughs> mass. All it needs is one charged particle to set off the chain reaction, right? Enter Orlando. Orlando is one of the Molly boys. Orlando's a dwarf. Orlando is drunk as hell, and Orlando wants to dance. So he just charges into the dance floor and starts bumping into people like a little demented pinball, just bouncing off people, you know? And he's going, ay, 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 <laughs> smashing into the, but, but he wasn't that out of it because he was hitting the girls a lot more than the guys. <laughs> and being three feet tall and leading with his nose, he was making frequent and intimate contact with these females, not all of whom appreciated it. He kept bombing around, you know? Now, one of these hippie girls was named Carla Jumper. Carla was actually half Indian, but she was a definite member of the love generation, you know? She was a real hot nature mama. Mm, yeah. Well, Orlando comes smashing up into her down about here, you know, and gives her an affectionate little nuzzle, 
and she gives him a right cross and knocks him down on the floor. And Orlando assumes a prone position and takes no further interest in the proceedings. Now, the Molly boys don't appreciate this for some reason. They take it personally, and all of a sudden, a volley of beer bottles all across the room. One of the hippies picks up a chair, decks one of the Molly boys. All of a sudden, we got a major cross-cultural interchange going on here. The band decides, well, we'll just keep playing. Music hath charms to soothe the savage beast. But not tonight, you know. <laughs> Finally, Fred saw the, the, the way things were going. He just got up and he backed up to the wall with his precious Martin guitar behind him. He was going to give up his body and save his guitar. So things were fairly out of hand. Now, the owner and bartender of the gay 90s is a guy named Dan. Big, handsome Dan. Big hat, long blonde hair and a beard. He's a, he was a door gunner on a Huey in Vietnam. And uh, he's still a little enthusiastic about firearms, you know. And he probably always, when he got a bar, he probably always visualized himself doing this. When the, the fights are going like crazy, and he says, this is a good time to try out my 357 Magnum. <laughs> so he picks it up, and he starts firing warning shots into the ceiling. Kaboom, 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 you know. I don't know if you've ever heard a 357 Magnum in, a, in close space, but er everyone in, in immediately desires to vacate the premises in as timely ma matter as possible, you know? The thing is, he's shooting up into the ceiling into the bedroom where his wife is upstairs. <laughs> he's so enthusiastic, he forgot she's up there, right? So these bullets are going, wham, these large caliber bullets are coming up around her. She thinks, oh, it's finally happened. Dan's post-Vietnam stress syndrome has kicked in. He's going to come up the stairs like Jack Nicholson in The Shining, you know. And so she climbs out the second story window, trying to get away from him. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Molly boys have run outside. The hippies start to run outside, but then, we're, you know, we're too scared of all the guns. And a lot of the hippies are still hallucinating, you know. They're going, bummer, man, bummer. <laughs> and we're all huddled around the door. But handsome Dan takes his gun, goes, cracks the front door of the bar. All the Molly boys go across the street where their pickups are parked, get their deer rifles down, train them on the front door. Standoff, you know. Dan's got his 57, he's got down, he says, I think you boys better get out of here. And the Molly boys say something about goats and, I don't know, something goats to do to Dan or vice versa, I forget. Anyway, there's the, the deal, you know. All of a sudden, help! We look up, and there is Dan's wife. She has gone in her nightgown out the window and is hanging on to the ledge. It's about 10 feet, though, from the ground. She's scared, you know? And Dan said, what the hell are you doing? You know, and she says, I don't know what I did, Dan, but I'll never do it again. Don't kill me, you know? <laughs> and everybody's going, what? What the hell is going on? And he says, Hold on! And he races upstairs to rescue his wife. She's hanging on to this ledge, you know? And uh, so the Molly boys are looking at this, and all the hippies are looking at this, and Carla Jumper says, Hold on, honey! If you let go, you'll break your ass, you know? Carla, see, Carla Jumper got her name. She got picked up by a movie star. I won't tell you who it is, but it was Dennis Hopper. <laughs> and he took her uh, to a little night of passion in the hotel room, and and he had even more colorful sexual proclivities than she was ready for. And uh, in escaping his advances, she wound up jumping out the second story window. She broke her hip, but she saved her virtue. So after that, she was called Carla Chumper. Anyway, she knows, right? <laughs> Hold on, honey, you'll break your ass. Okay. And then she yells to the Molly boys, bring that pickup over here and rescue her. The Molly boys, for some reason, she had so much authority that they just put their guns down one of them jumped in the truck and backs up the pickup truck to the front of the bar. And they get up in the back of the truck, and the hippies are helping, and they're trying to reach her feet and getting her. Well, just when they're about to get her down, here comes Dan at the upstairs window. And, you know, and she goes, she sees him. He's still waving his gun, of course. And she goes, ah, let's go. Falls in the bed of the truck with all these guys, you know, around her in her nightgown. And Dan's looking down. Seeing his wife in this compromised position, you know, get your hands off my wife, you know. And the uh, the driver of the truck, some poor Molly guy, thinks, you know, 
something's imminent, and he floors it. Takes off with Dan's wife and a couple of Molly boys, and they're gone. Dan runs downstairs, jumps in his truck, squeals the tires, and he's gone. So the rest of us, Molly boys and hippies, you know, events have somehow overtaken our ability to participate. So the bar's still open, so we just all go in and help ourselves to drinks, you know? We're just going, hey, man, I wasn't really going to shoot you, bro. Far out, man. I know where you're coming from. You know? Carla is nice, and Orlando wakes up. And Carla's even nice to Orlando. She says she's sorry she punched him. And by way of apology, she gives him a hit of LSD. <laughs> Unfortunately, Orlando takes it. But that's another story. 